recording. That's great. I shall mute myself and I'll allow you to introduce yourself then, since I haven't read your bio recently, being a colleague of mine here in the, in the, uh, the IBM. Right, so over to you. All right. Thanks so much, Linda. Um, my name's Deborah Davis. I'm Professor of Midwifery at uh, the ACT Health, um, shared appointment with the government and also the University of Canberra. Um, I've been on the uh, organising committee for this conference since it first began 10 years ago. And um, I'm just excited every year to see um, how wide a reach it has. And you can see from the chat box there, um, people are just coming from all parts of the world and of course as the 24 hours progresses um, some of us will need to go to bed and others will be waking up and joining us for the first time and I'm also really happy to see um, some names there I recommend from previous years so I know that um, people have been coming back again and again. Um, welcome to this session and thank you for bearing with us. We, um, our speakers haven't made it and sometimes that happens. It could be an internet issue, um, it could be a time conversion issue, but for whatever reason um, they're not able to join us and that's disappointing because we were going to hear a great presentation from Pakistan. Um, so I'm going to fill in. You weren't expecting this, but um, I thought a presentation on obesity might be interesting to you. This is an area that I've been working um, in now for a few years and um, it captures my interest because, you know, it's something that we can really make a difference in as midwives and it's also an area where I think um, there's a lot of stigmatism and even in the health sector where we say we give care that's very non-judgmental, um, I think that's not always the case. I think um, there's a lot of room for improvement in our maternity service. Um, obesity is a problem um, for most countries now, um, even those countries that um, aren't well resourced um, are struggling with women eating the wrong sorts of foods and um, becoming more and more obese. So uh, something for all of us. Um, you know that in most health services we look, we use the body mass index as a measure of women's obesity. It is a really crude measure. Um, it is our weight in kilograms divided by the square of our height. And of course, um, if you're uh, it, what it doesn't account for is um, the weight of different components of our body, like bone, um, uh, of course, fat, but uh, muscle. And we know that muscle is quite heavy. So you could be someone who was very muscly and developed um, and therefore you'd, you'd weigh um, a significant amount um, and you could have a high BMI. And so that doesn't necessarily reflect the amount of fat that you're carrying in your body. But it's very difficult to use other sorts of measures in the context of maternity care. Um, there are different ways of determining how much fat we're carrying, which include um, the uh, caliper um, measurements, but they're very time consuming and require some expertise. So we use this very crude measure um, and it's just important to appreciate that um, using the BMI um, is not completely accurate. It gives us some idea of someone's um, adiposity. This is one of the classification systems that, that's used to identify um, what's normal BMI um, uh, under and over. This one comes from the Institute of Medicine, which is um, a, quite an esteemed organisation who's uh, uh, governed by a panel of experts and also a group who've done a lot of research in this area. Um, so underweight is usually defined as a BMI of less than 18.5. Um, normal is between 18.5 and 24.9. And then you'll see as you become overweight um, and then into the obese classes, they've been subdivided into class one, two and three. And you can see to the right of that column that the risk of complications emerging um, by BMI um, is like a dose effect. So 
the complications, um, those risks are higher depending on how much additional weight someone is carrying. So someone may be um, only just a little bit overweight and they wouldn't have a lot of extra risk um, that is brought to their pregnancy due to their weight status, but it does significantly increase as the BMI increases. So this is uh, an audit that we did in two large area health services in Australia a few years ago. Um, and we had over, um, oh, I think it was more than, more than um, 10,000 births in this audit. And uh, this was just categorising women uh, by their pre-pregnancy BMI and um, what category they fell into. So you can see that um, it was roughly 60% had a normal BMI. We weren't looking at the underweights here. We were just um, looking at those who were over. Um, and then um, about almost 25%, 24% were overweight and, and the other quarter uh, were different degrees of obese. So this was a few years ago now and it is an area that's um, rapidly changing unfortunately with more and more women becoming overweight and obese so I wouldn't be surprised that if we did this again um, today that we would have a larger group of women in the overweight and a larger group of women in the um, obese categories but it does demonstrate that we're, we're talking about a, a large proportion of women in our service Uh, it's always really important that we uh, don't judge any women in our service, but particularly around obesity because it is associated with low socioeconomic status. So women that don't have good access to um, financial resources, to, um, to education, to all the resources that go with someone um, who um, is in a higher socioeconomic status, they are more likely to have obesity for very complex reasons. Lack of education is highly associated with obesity. There is without a doubt genetic components to obesity, so we do inherit some propensity uh, to be obese or to um, be at risk of obese through our lifetimes. And there's also cultural norms and expectations. So it's not... In every country, it isn't necessarily attractive um, to have a, a normal body weight. Some cultures prefer women that are that are rounder and heavier, or there might be cultural practices or norms um, around the ability to to exercise or around certain food groups that just make it more difficult for women um, in some cultural groups to maintain a normal body mass index. The health risks are, are pretty well documented and you'd be able to find these on um, within a lot of guidelines um, from professional groups. Um, this one comes from a Queensland government, which is in Australia, a guideline, and it, it's very well uh, put together. So it's one that I could recommend to you. Um, they do reference all these uh, conditions and the, the research that informs them. Um, but just for simplicity, I'm presenting them without their references. Um, but I'm sure, as as midwives, many of you know that uh, the health risks in relation to pregnancy really span every uh, part of the pregnancy, labour and birth and postpartum period, uh, even stretching from preconception. So it, it is more difficult for women of high BMIs to become pregnant in the first place. And then once they do become pregnant, the range of um, potential complexities. But as I said, we have to remember that these are dose dependent. So not everybody is going to experience um, any of these complications, but the heavier they are, the more likely they are to experience um, one or more. And, and I'm sure you've read what some of those were there. Um, we've got from pre-pregnancy, we've gone through the antepartum period, now into the intrapartum period, there are a range of additional uh, potential complications. 
the postpartum period and the neonatal. And some of those complications arise um, just because of the mechanics of having additional weight. So the interstitial uh, tissues are more crowded with fat. So really the birth canal and the, the, the um, pathway for the baby is much more crowded um, when there's fat in those interstitial periods. So you've got a, a baby, sometimes a bigger baby, trying to get out of a smaller space. So there are mechanical issues. Um, there are also uh, physiological issues um, right down to the, the way that the cells are functioning, for example, in, in the uterus. So the contractibility might not be there. Um, and that's why there's often slow progress. Um, there's a higher risk of PPH, for example. Um, and then um, into the breast tissue. So when there's additional um, uh, fat tissue in the breast, the circulation um, to the ducts and lactogenesis might not be as efficient. So there are issues with uh, breastfeeding as well. And then of course we um, there there are there is research now suggesting that the intrauterine environment of the fetus can have an impact on the baby um, through its lifetime. So potentially um, that environment can um, increase the risk of that baby to obesity through its lifetime beyond just the the nurture um, in relation to the culture of the family and eating and exercise habits but something happening potentially epigenetically um, to the fetus in the in that sort of environment so this is just back to uh, the audit that i mentioned that we did on this um, uh, hospital database. We we looked at women in those different uh, BMI categories, the normal, the overweight and the three classes of obesity. And we just looked at some of the clinical outcomes. Um, as I said, these were in New South Wales, Australia, um, but that you could go to any uh, many, many pieces of research that really demonstrating the same thing. There's there's an enormous amount of research out there on this topic uh, relating clinical outcomes to uh, women's weight, um, and you can see you can see the dose effect here. Um, this was an antenatal admission, so it wasn't uh, care episodes when these women might be seen by a midwife or other maternity health provider, but actually being admitted to hospital. Uh, it's not telling us what they were admitted for, but you can see there's um, the proportions are increasing as the BMIs are increasing. And in that highest category, 30% uh, of those women had an admission to hospital uh, during their pregnancy. And usually we don't um, admit women to hospital unless it's a pretty significant condition. These are just narrowing down, um, looking at women who have hypertension or diabetes in their pregnancy. Uh, so if you were just comparing the normal weight women with the ob obese class three women, you could see there's quite a disparity there. A lot more women um, with that heavier BMI being um, diagnosed with problems with hypertension or diabetes. And they're some of the most common conditions related to BMI. Cesarean section, uh, at the rate at this time for women who had a normal BMI was 24%. And then uh, we can see that dose relationship going right up to 50% for obese class three. And we know that they're, they're women who um, are really at high risk from the cesarean section. So um, you're exposing this group to um, hemorrhage to DVTs, to anaesthetic problems, to wound infections. There's a whole um, additional consequence of a woman with a very high BMI um, having a caesarean section, but 50% of this group had caesarean sections. This uh, was looking at macrosomic babies or babies that were over 4,000 grams, four kilos. Um, not such a, a neat stepped up pattern here, but still uh, twice the proportion um, in the obese class three as the, OB, as the normal weight women.
And then um, this is very uh, small proportions if you look at the percentages on the top of each one. Um, but this is APGARs with zero at five minutes. So these, these are babies that um, probably didn't survive if they had an APGAR of zero at five minutes, definitely. Um, like I said, it's, a, it's very small percentages, 0 point, so a third of 1% for the normal category, but it's almost up to 1% for the women who are in obese class three. So that's almost one in 100, um, which is a really very, very tragic outcome. Uh, admitted to NICU, I'll just fly through these now. So um, we've got increasing rates there. Uh, and the other thing about this is that women do tend to gain weight with each pregnancy. And I know there's another presentation or it might already have been today um, on this tendency to, to carry additional weight um, with each baby. So what happens, you know, the first pregnancy, a woman might be a normal weight. She might gain a little bit too much in pregnancy. And then after she's had that baby, she's got a couple of extra kilos that she's not been able to shift. So she comes into the next pregnancy a little bit heavier. Um, and then the next one a bit heavier again. So that, that can be moving women from a normal weight into an overweight and sometimes into obese. Um, we also know that more and more women are coming um, even to their first pregnancy already overweight or already obese. So that problem's just being compounded um, with each successive baby. So this was the BMI um, by parity that really demonstrates this. Uh, the women who um, were nulliparous uh, went coming in to us to have their first baby, their BMI was uh, still in the normal range, the average BMI of all these women. And then by the time they were having their fifth babies, um, their BMIs were quite high on average 28.8. .8. So that's uh, almost obese as an average. But we do have to remember as well that women are getting older over this period of time. So um, it's not only the fact of having these babies, but um, the, the fact of ageing. So as we move through the childbearing years, um, typically women are, are gaining weight, gaining a few kilos, um, regardless of whether or not they're having babies. So just a little bit now, that's the statistics. And of course, behind every statistic, there's a woman who's having a pregnancy and a baby and, um, and needs our maternity care. So a really Im important part of this is what are women's experiences of having maternity care? And this literature here comes from a literature review on women's experiences. So this wasn't our own research. I've got some references for you at the end, but we had a really careful look at um, how women are finding care. Um, the thing about obesity or overweight is it's a very visible condition. It's not like diabetes or hypertension where you can go through the world and people wouldn't be looking at you going, oh my goodness, she's got diabetes. Um, so it's something people can see. And of course, there's a lot of social pressure in our world to be slim and to be beautiful. Um, so there's a lot of stigma attached to being overweight. Um, and it is associated with moral qualities like lack of self-control, like greed, like laziness, like selfishness. So people do um, see an obese or overweight body and um, attach these moral qualities to it. Um, which is pretty unhelpful really, because as we, we know, there's a range of reasons why people could be overweight or obese. Um, so it's also a very public body. The pregnant body is quite a public body. And you'll know this if you've ever been pregnant and subject to people touching your body or patting your belly um, in any way. So this is just a quotation from someone and, and for her, uh, she's an overweight woman who is pregnant, but um, she feels more confident in her body. 
but people do feel increased um, scrutiny from the public when they're pregnant. So um, we see this in other areas, for example, women who smoke, people would be uh, looking at them sideways um, if they're pregnant and they're smoking, drinking alcohol. Same with obesity and pregnancy. Um, some women feel like they're being looked at and judged. Some women have a very uh, positive image of their their body in pregnancy. Um, and, and sometimes it's negative. So we, we can't necessarily um, determine how women might be feeling about their bodies when they're pregnant um, and overweight and obese. Some, some will like their bodies and some won't. So I guess that's just like all of us, isn't it? So um, it, it's interesting, isn't it, what's um, socially sanctioned. Um, so some women have said, um, that's a great excuse. You're, you're allowed to put on weight when you're pregnant. So, you know, I feel like um, it's, a good, it's a good excuse and um, people won't judge me so much. This was really um, interesting. So uh, women who feel quite relaxed about their, their body size, um, sometimes they think, well, uh, you know, I'm just, I have the pregnancy and we'll worry about this later on. But I think a, a future slide might show that that does tend to be the primiparous women because women who've had babies before might have experienced um, how difficult it is to shed those extra few kilos. So they tend to be the group who are a little bit more careful in pregnancy where the primiparous women um, could tend to be a little bit more relaxed thinking it's going to come off pretty easily after I've had my baby. Yeah, so there's an example of um, one woman who had an experience uh, with a previous pregnancy of finding a little bit hard to get that weight off. And something that is pretty clear in the literature um, across a variety of different countries actually is that women get very mixed messages about weight gain in pregnancy from their health carers. Um, so some health carers don't address it at all and women interpret that as it's not important as you can see from that quote. So uh, the, my midwife or my health carer, they raise things with me that are important. So if that wasn't raised, it mustn't be important. And I think there's a, there's a lot of reasons for this ambiguity. Um, one is that health carers find it's such a sensitive issue that they don't know how to broach it with women. Um, they don't want to risk the relationship. They don't want to offend them. Uh, or some don't know what to recommend. They don't know what the recommended weight gain is in pregnancy or they don't feel like they've got the skills to help them. Um, if the, even if the women want to try and have a, a healthier weight gain in pregnancy. So they don't say anything about it. And then there are, um, and these are hard to read as a health carer. There, there are a lot of women who have um, very bad experiences in our maternity services. So those, the things that women are worried about is actually being weighed and um, particularly if they're going to be weighed somewhere that might be a bit public, um, they might have been avoiding um, their weight and what they weigh for some time. So they don't want to know for themselves um, and they just don't want that embarrassment. And I've heard of people uh, some women not even going to antenatal care because this is such a concern for them. The, 
then uh, not only exposing their weight but exposing their bodies so they they know that um, they uh, might be exposed at, at least on the abdomen when they're having palpations or you know when they're having their babies parts of their bodies will be exposed and even with their intimate partners some women didn't feel comfortable um, being naked so I think that's something that's really important for us to remember every woman obese or not obese or overweight or not overweight um, will have their own issues around their body and um, their own comfort zones in relation to um, their their naked bodies um, even with intimate partners. So we can't make any presumptions about what they're comfortable or not comfortable with. And then there's, there's a whole area that women are reporting about their bodies being difficult bodies because the, 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 the body habitus is, is large. Perhaps it's making the ultrasound difficult because there's body fat that um, has to be uh, navigated um, on the ultrasound. Um, we, as midwives, can find it more difficult to palpate the, the baby, the position of the baby, the size of the baby. Um, sometimes if they're having procedures done, um, you know, sometimes if we're lifting a, a woman's leg, their, their leg can be heavy. Um, so they, they do perceive their body as being a difficult body and a, a body that's getting in the way and, and they feel guilty about this because they know perhaps their baby can't be visualised or the posi position of the baby can't be um, found so easily. So, it, you know, we have to be really careful if we are having these sorts of problems to be enormously tactful because women are going to feel embarrassed and potentially guilty about that. And then, of course, there's this whole area of risk. You know, they've got a, a risky body and that seems to be the only thing everybody concentrates on. So, you know, I did start the presentation with the litany of potential problems and complexities and risks uh, that face this group of women. But we do have to always remember that they're, you know, they're having a baby first and foremost, which is such a life-affirming experience and and they don't want to hear every single time they come to the service about the risks uh, so particularly when they're seeing someone different every time and if everybody's going to hound them about the risk we we end up just alienating these women and making them feel worse which isn't helpful um, and really taking the the shine off a, a pregnancy that by and large they should be able to enjoy So, yeah, we can sit there and go, okay, well, all this is terrible and we don't want women to have be having these terrible experiences. So what can we do? What are more positive encounters that this group of women can have? Uh, and I think they, uh, from the literature, women say they really like affirming encounters. And for that, uh, what they mean by that is that uh, women... Uh, the health carers are frank with them and upfront with them. So they don't want us to be uh, secretive um, or keep things from them. Uh, so being upfront um, and also, yes, yeah, so they're not planning care behind their back, um, but also dealing with things um, with humour. So um, diffusing embarrassing situations with laughter together and but I think you know there can be a fine line can't there um, with humor sometimes um, they really liked it when caregivers were interested in the woman so like this woman said you know there's the baby and then there's me and um, you know she said well I'm, I'm not really an oven just an incubator for a baby um, she, you know she wants someone to know about her and how she's feeling and having an interest in her so I think that's something that's pretty easy that we could all do. Uh, participating in their own care. So, you know, potentially uh, weighing themselves. We don't necessarily have to weigh them. We can ask them to take their weight or, or bring their weight with them if they're weighing them. We don't have to uh, do it and we don't have to do it in a public place, certainly. Um, and caregivers who are encouraging and supportive, especially when they're achieving personal goals. And one of my students told me a story 
um, recently of uh, one of the women she was um, providing care to as a student midwife who, who uh, went to the hospital service to book in and she'd already lost 10 kilos um, in an attempt to get healthy for her pregnancy and she'd gotten pregnant and um, and she was still leading a really healthy lifestyle but she was still overweight even though she'd lost some weight and without asking or uh, you know about this woman's situation um, the health carers just launched into a, a, a pretty punitive attack on her and her weight and the risks um, making the woman feel terrible when she'd actually already done so much to get herself in a great position for pregnancy. So, you know, finding out where women are at, uh, finding out what they've done so far, it, it's a great opportunity in pregnancy because most women really do want to focus on their health at this time. So, you know, I think we, we could be encouraging, we could be helping women to set some small achievable goals um, and we could be helping them work towards those and having a healthy weight gain in their pregnancy at the very least. I think if women don't want to do anything about it, if we put it to them and um, ask them if they want to focus on their um, their weight gain in pregnancy, if they don't want to, then I don't think we should go there. Thanks, Linda. Um, I think we should let it go. But some people are going to want to focus on it. So what should we do as health carers? Um, you know, in this ideal world, women would have a normal BMI before they got to pregnancy. Um, we would all love that. But look, they don't, do they? And they're not going to. And we're still going to have a lot of women coming to our service already heavier than they need to be. So we do really need to work with them to defend their dignity and their privacy and promote their comfort in pregnancy. We do have to provide appropriate care for that group in pregnancy and sometimes that does mean additional monitoring, sometimes that does mean um, extra services and um, things, doing things differently than you would to other people. Um, we can try and help them achieve, uh, prevent excessive weight gain in this pregnancy because that will benefit them long term and it will benefit them when they come in uh, if they have future babies with us. Um, and we can pot potentially introduce some lifestyle changes, some small changes that might help them avoid excessive weight gain between pregnancies. So there's a lot we can do with this uh, health promotion focus of midwifery um, in helping to make these women make some changes, but also to giving them a, a better experience of our service. So the recommended weight gain, these are in kilos. If, you, if you're used to working in pounds, you'll find um, this in pounds on, on the internet. Again, it comes from the Institute of Medicine. Um, so they do recommend uh, smaller weight gains for women who have high BMIs. So the least somebody should gain is five to nine kilos throughout their pregnancy and that's for a woman with a BMI of greater than 30. It's definitely not recommended that women have weight loss or no weight gain in pregnancy. That's found to be associated with uh, a range of unhealthy outcomes including premature birth and uh, growth retarded babies. So they should be able to gain at least five kilos um, and that probably does represent a a bit of a, a, a weight loss when when the baby and all the pregnancy um, weight is taken into consideration. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. So uh, I won't go through these, but there are a range of things that we might need to do additionally for women who are overweight or obese. And I'll just flick through them. So if you wanted to review them um, on the video we could and ag again as I said it really is going to depend on uh, what women's weight is if they're a little bit overweight there are not going to be additional risks uh, this is a, a photo of Harmony and Jasper and um, Harmony's photo I found on Flickr and I asked her if she'd be happy if we could use it um, because she just looks so uh, gorgeous Yeah, so happy to take any questions. Thank you.
Are you there, Linda? Hi, um, Cheryl. I'm not. I'm not aware of um, any uh, what the recommendations might be for weight gain who've had bariatric surgery. But I know that um, there is a lot of work looking at the um, nutritional condition, I guess, of um, women with, who've had bariatric surgery because that might not be optimal. They they certainly um, might need some supplementation. It depends on how many, um, you know, what they're diet is like because some women after bariatric surgery I know um, can be really struggling to, to get the nutrients that they need. Um, so I'm not sure what the weight gain recommendations would be. I'd be surprised um, if it was very different from that the BMI categories. I'm trying to think of how it could be different. If any of you want to ask a question directly to uh, De Professor Deborah Davis, uh, I will now uh, give you the option of uh, using your uh, micro. Do we have anyone ask, to want to ask any questions? I think uh, yeah, someone said that it's often not prioritised in our settings. I mean, that's right. And and sometimes actually some policies are quite punitive against women that um, have high BMIs. For example, water birth um, might be um, not uh, promoted for women who have high BMIs. Um, you know, they might need continuous monitoring in, in some services. And, uh, you know, I think water immersion is actually a great thing for someone who's got a high BMI because it can just take the, the pressure off the knees um, of the woman or, or the joints and they can change position much more easily. So I think we do have to think carefully about what, how can we make uh, the experience of this group of women better in our health, health service. Can obesity cause asynclitic presentation? Yes, I'm, I'm not really sure. I think um, it may be, it probably depends a bit on what the fat deposition is like in, in the woman in, in the abdomen and in those in interstitial tissues. Um, I haven't um, thought about that specifically. Thank you. Yep, we can finish. Thank you. Um, I just want to say I, I see the speakers from Pakistan did turn up in the end and I'm so sorry. We just couldn't wait any longer. Um, but I, I hope that you'll have another opportunity to present your great work. And thank you to the audience for um, accepting this diff very different topic at the last minute. Yes, I agree, Hilma. I absolutely agree. Okay. okay. Uh, over to you, Annette. Okay. We the this session is coming uh, to to a closing now. Thank you very much, Sir Deborah, for for standing in in a very short notice with the presentation.